The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Pow! What's up, guys? Well, tonight we have a great show. I got two special guests tonight. We got NYPD in the house, okay? I got Bill Cannon. He is uh, an ex-boss of the North Manhattan Homicide Division uh, for about 10 years. But these guys are great guys, and they have their own podcast. I have Phil Grimaldi, who was a second-grade detective. They're going to uh, come along, give us a couple stories, tell us a little about them. Uh, they have a podcast called Police Off the Cuff. So we're going to have a good show tonight. I'm going to give a shout-out to Live and Let Live, one of my moderators, Boston J. I see you. Dawn Marie, how are you? Rob D, Anthony Motos, Kevin Barracudos, I Paint Houses, Rob D, Boston Red, and to everyone else in the chat, thanks for coming on. Now, I went on these guys' uh, podcast and I had a real nice time with them. They're going to be on mine tonight. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a nice time. Police off the cuff. These are two really good guys. And uh, I'm waiting for Phil to get in there, Bill. I see you in there. You want to come on now? Okay. Well, so I want to say, you know, everything that's going on with YouTube is insane. A lot of people need medicine and, uh, you know, a lot of mental patients, I'll tell you the truth, honestly. But, you know, these two guys tonight are NYPD guys, and they make me a little nervous. You know, being around cops, I get a little nervous sometimes, you know. They might break me tonight. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be so happy to have them on. I am. We were supposed to do this a long time ago, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to this. Gunsmoke the Don, I see you. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. Sebastian Shiara, how are you? So uh, I think I'm just waiting for Phil to come in the chat, in the studio. Once he's in the studio, I'll uh, let them in, and uh, I have a couple questions for them. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I'm going off the cuff with this, you know? I didn't write down a whole bunch of questions. I figured I'd just hit them with a couple, and then I'll go from there, you know. But, uh, you know, doing this, you know, in time, I get a little better and better. So I know it's going to be a good one tonight. So, Bill, you want to come in? You want to come in? I right, listen. So... Dawn Marie, I see you. Now, what do you ask an ex-detective and an ex-homicide guy? What kind of questions do you ask them? I really don't know. How was your childhood? What made you become a cop? You know, I'm sure they could have went the wrong direction at one time. You know, they probably had someone giving them direction to become a cop. You know, because when you're a kid, you know, who wants to become a cop? You know, is that your goal to become a cop? No, right? But I guess you become a cop, and then from a cop, you become a detective, and then you move up the ladder, right? So, you know, that's a good thing. i tell you the truth. I wish I would have followed that direction because I have a cousin, Teddy, that's actually a first-grade detective on my father's side. I really didn't get to know them too much. I know them. I correspond with them every so often. But I think if I knew them a little better, I might have went that route instead of the route that I went. So, 
So, Gaetano Bracco, how are you? Benny Bronx. I'm waiting for Phil Grimaldi to come in the studio. He should be here soon. Now, how's everyone out there? I'm just looking in the uh, the chat over here. But, you know, this is uh, going to be a good one. I'm a little nervous, I'll tell you the truth, with these guys. These guys have a great podcast, Police Off the Cuff. They do a hell of a job. You know, I heard that they're uh, changing their intro soon. You know, their intro is a little like Welcome Back, Carter. You know, but uh, I heard they're going to make a new one, and uh, they're going to (laughs) upgrade with a little more seriousness to it, a little more banging to it. (laughs) But uh, they're good guys. I'm looking forward to this. Jimmy Babes, how are you, buddy? Good, how are you? Austin J, Jimmy Love, Loyalty, God, Family, Country. So tonight we got NYPD in the house, you know? So uh, this is pretty cool. You know, who would think that, you know, the life I lived, the career I went down, you know, that I would be sitting down in a podcast, doing an interview. I don't look at it as an interview, but just chopping up with a uh, ex-homicide guy and an ex-detective, right? And uh, Tommy Days is a very dear friend of mine. So, you know, who would think? But the thing in life is, you know, it's not where you start. It's where you finish. And, uh, you know, thank God I'm at where, where I am today and uh, going the right direction and good people around me. Satin. Much respect to the police all over this great nation. Absolutely. And these two guys, not only are they, uh, you know, ex-cops, but they are also first responders at 9-11. So, you know, to me, they're also heroes. You know, they don't run away from the building. They ran into the building. They ran towards the building to help people. So these guys are heroes too, you know. And you don't make men like this anymore. You know, the world is changing. Let's see who else I got over here. You change for the best, buddy. Thank you. Live and let live. God bless the NYPD and all over our country. Yes. Amen. Anyone who wants to defund the police is a moron. Isn't that the truth? I'm not going to get too much into politics today unless, you know, they want to, but not too much. You got to whack MRE. He's out of control. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens with him. Hey, Jimmy, it's Brian. What's up, Brian? How's everything? Respect, Jimmy. Love your show. Watching always from Flatbush, Brooklyn. Shout out to Flatbush. Jimmy, you are not who you were in 1988. I love you. I love you too. Let's see Ryan Brown. Jimmy, looking forward to tonight. Bill and Phil are great guys with a great podcast. Awesome to have three of my favorite people tonight. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Jimmy, can I get a shout out? Alphonse Brooklyn. Alphonse Brooklyn, what's up? Brooklyn in the house, baby. So, Phil, you Phil, you ready? You want to come on? <laughs> but these guys are good guys. We're going to have a good show with them. So far, we have 118 people in the chat. Benny Bronx, let's see, Donnie Ragu, Jimmy, what you do for the kids is tremendous, much respect. You know what, listen, I, I try to help anybody I can, you know, listen, I've been down and out of my life, I've been in dark places, and I thank God every day where I am, 
You know, I have good people around me. And uh, every day I want to make my crooked pass right. Okay, so we got Phil Grimaldi in the studio. So we're going to get this started, okay? I've been waiting for Phil. So here they are. It's a stream. It's a stream. There they go. Phil, how are you, Phil? How are you? Good to see I, you. How you doing there, buddy? I'll tell you, listen, you guys make me nervous. How <laughs> come? What, what are we doing making you nervous, Jim? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, listen, I'm very happy to have you guys. You know, uh, you guys really uh, are an inspiration to me. I would never, ever think that I would be interviewing you know, two NYPD guys. And, uh, you know, thank you very, very much for giving me this opportunity to sit down with you guys and chop it up. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, Jimmy, I wanted to say that uh, I'm pretty amazed at how well you're doing in this podcast stuff. It's a tough, it's tough to get people to listen to you. It's tough to be original and it's tough to keep getting people subscribing. And, I mean, we were stuck at like 23,000 for about three months. We're just starting to move. We're almost at 25 now. But it's it, it we hit we grew real fast and then we stopped. So and it gets discouraging. You know how it is, right? No, absolutely. And the thing is you're always looking at the numbers, right? You see if they're going up. Sometimes you see, wow, you know what? Five of them walked away, then ten of them added. But uh you know, you know Jimmy, I gotta tell you a quick story because it's funny. Yeah. I look at the Patreon, you know, but that's the people that pay to see us. And the numbers were dropping. One day I look and I go, my fucking son dropped out that prick. He was paying seven bucks a month. I called him up. I go, you fuck. I go, I paid for your college education. You can't pay seven bucks a month to watch the podcast. Oh, sorry, dad. You know, it's like I'm going to kill him. <laughs> this, this poor kid's never going to live that down. You don't know. And it was one of those weeks where we lost five or ten people. I was like, you little prick. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know what Billy forgot to tell you though is that he was only at like four or five thousand till he met me. That's what. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Phil, I it. made a real parmesan. The whole Brooklyn crew. Yeah. Well, so far we have 149 in the chat. Okay. Now, you guys, uh, when did you start your podcast anyway? We actually started it like three years ago, but we were doing it all wrong. We weren't doing it on YouTube. We didn't start doing it on YouTube or concentrating on YouTube till like a year ago, maybe 14 months ago. So we were doing the podcast on the listening sites and not doing like a, a video one. And it, the money is on YouTube, even though YouTube is the hardest venue to be on. Because as you know, you got to get a thousand subscribers to get monetized and then you need 4,000 hours. And then yeah. the more subscribers you get, the more ads and the more money you can make. Yes. Now, right now, I'm stuck on 23, but I'm moving along. And like you said, you know what? It's not easy. It's very hard, you know, because uh, you got to interact. What I do is every Sunday, I interact with the audience, you know. I give them, uh, you know, they have the opportunity to come on here and they could tell a story or something that's going on in their life. And I like that, you know, because, uh, listen, as you know, every one of us are battling something, whether it's uh, – a depression, mental illness, or fighting a battle of someone we lost. It's always something. 100%. You know, Phil, he lost the big ore he uses to stir the pot of sauce on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> He's now, always making big big jobs about making the sauce, about stirring the sauce. <laughs> so this past Sunday, my wife made a big sauce with uh, Rajol and spare ribs and the meatballs, the whole nine yards. He says, what happened? You weren't starting. I said, I lost the yours. So. <laughs> I'll tell you, you, know, you two guys really gel well together. You know, and, uh, you know, Phil, you're an Irishman, right? Yes. And Phil's Italian. Now, Phil, you're from Brooklyn. Phil, you're from originally? I grew up on Long Island. I, I mean, I was born in Queens, but I grew up on Long Island, and now I'm from Westchester. Now, what made you guys come together and do this podcast? Oh, we met a on story. a TV show. We were on a TV show called show called The Perfect Murder. And I had done a bunch of episodes where I played like a detective. And Phil showed up one day and he goes, I'm playing uh, one of the detectives. And he was really nervous. I go, don't worry about it. I go, just 
do what you do at work. That's all. <laughs> let, let me let me pick up on that story yeah. a little bit. So a good friend of ours, Rick Torelli, who's also a retired detective, he was the executive producer of the show called Perfect Murder. So he told me, oh, if you got any stories, you could give me stories. We'll put them on the show. I said, all right, Ricky. So I hadn't seen him for a while, never heard from him. So I ran into him at a function. I says, Ricky, you know, you, you still want stories? He's like, yeah, yeah. He gives me his card. He says, call me. Then he goes, you want to play a detective on the show? I thought he was kidding. So I says, yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know? So I called him. I went and I did a, uh, a quick, uh, uh, what do you call it? Wait, 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 audition. Try out. I, did an audition. I did an audition. I read a couple of lines. The girl goes, oh yeah, we're going to use you. We'll call you the end of the week. I never heard from them. So I called him the following week. It was right near Christmas. I was trying to get plans made for Christmas. You know, I says, Ricky, what are we doing? It was, I, it was a Tuesday. I'll never forget it. He goes, what do you mean? I says, I, we, they told me you're going to use me. Are we doing the show or what? He's like, we're filming Friday. You're in it. What are you talking? They didn't call you? I said, nah, nobody called me. So now he calls me back. He's like, the girl's going to call you. P.S. The girl says, all right, you know, uh, we're going to send you a couple of lines to read. Uh, be over here on Friday afternoon, a uh, Friday morning, right? So it was out in Queens. So I get there early, right? I get there and I'm figuring I'm going to see the trucks and everything. Nobody's there. I said, man, I got the wrong friggin' address. I start calling Ricky Torelli. He's like, no, 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 you're in the right spot. Just stay there. We're coming from Manhattan, you know? So all of a sudden, the car pulls up. It's Bill Cannon, you know? I says, I look at him. I says, this guy's got to be a cop, you know? So I knock on the window. I, How you doing? Yeah, you with the show? Yeah. So I says, listen, I never did this before. He says, Phil, don't worry about it. He goes, just follow my lead. He goes, you know, we're going to interview people like we did on the job. It's just like being on the job. And next thing you know, the lights were set up. You know, they put the piece of tape on the floor and action. And we were rolling and everything just went good. I wound up doing like three episodes. I think Billy did about six of them. And yeah, uh, six, then they canceled the show on us. But uh, so we stayed in touch after that. And uh, we tried out for a couple other things. And then he started the podcast. I came on as a guest and he knew he couldn't go forward without me. So here That's I right. am. The host. <laughs> no, I, I had him on as a guest. So it was like an audition, you know. And he was a guest a bunch of times, and I go, he's pretty good. So then I, I, um, I brought him on as a co-host. <laughs> I'll tell you, you guys are like naturals with the podcast. You really gel very well together. You're a very well spoken. Uh, Phil, I mean, Phil loves to talk. He's a talker, Phil. <laughs> sometimes yeah. I gotta shut him the fuck up. He talks too much. <laughs> but, uh, he cuts so my mic sometimes. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but Phil is originally from Avenue U, right, Phil? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, a couple of my family members. Yes. Yes. They told me, but, uh, so where do we start with you guys? You know, so what made you, you know, as a young kid, how were you as a young kid growing up, say in Brooklyn, Phil, you know, what made you want to become a cop? Because in Brooklyn, I mean, in our neighborhood, usually you become a criminal. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I was getting pulled in two different directions, but I was, you know, my family, my, my grandparents met in Coney Island. They're from Coney Island. Uh, second generation, they moved a little bit towards Avenue X. And uh, uh, I grew up right on like, Neck Road and, and like uh, Van Sickle Street around near Wolf Place. So anyways, there was influences from the street 100%. But my parents put us in Catholic school. So that was a little bit of a help. Uh, I had a very strong family around me. My mother and father got divorced when I was like 11, but my father was a, uh, worked for the, for the state. He was a special agent for uh, the Division of Unemployment. Uh, and then he wound up working in the office and stuff. But I had an uncle named Frank Tomasino who was a, a NYPD cop. And he was the guy that everybody went to in the family when there was problems, situations. And then my other uncle owned a junkyard in Coney Island. So I got an education from them. And all my mother's uh, brothers, they were all very close, very tight. And, you know, now we were going into the third generation. And, you know, my uncle worked for the transit diary. My other uncle, like I said, was a cop. My other uncle was an electrician. So they were like pushing us in the direction of civil service, get a real job, you know. And trust me, I was around a lot of shit on Avenue, drugs, gangsters. I knew them all. I worked in a Salamaria when I was a kid. And I could have went to the left. But there was a guy by the name, uh, you'll know him, uh, Jimmy. Nikki Black, Nikki Black Granasio. Oh, yeah. Now, when I was a kid growing up, I was working in the Sala Maria and he would come in there from time to time. And, you know, I would talk with him and, and he was like in the truckers union, all, all of that. Uh, his nephew actually is a, a detective by the name of Luis Garcella, who I also met back then. But anyways, when I was talking about becoming a cop, he chimed in one day and he says to me, listen, kid, he goes, if you're going to be a cop, be a good cop. 
if you're going to be a crook, be a good crook. And I never forgot that, you know, and the things that I learned from the street growing up uh, about loyalty and stuff like that, it always stayed with me, you know, so I, I was like into the cop thing when I saw the movie French Connection. My uncle was a cop, he used to let us play with his gun. He would unload it, let us pull the trigger, drive fire and all that. And then the stories that came out of him, forget about it, you know. So that was my intrigue. But then as I got older, like I said, you know, 17, 18, you know, there wasn't a lot of work, car service, this, that. And there was a big uh, influx of drugs. I'm talking about 78, 79. Drugs were everywhere. It would have been very easy to go that route. But I started taking the civil service test. I just about made it out of high school. I, I wound up dropping out and I took the GED just like our friend Tommy Dades. So, you know, again, uh, it could have went one way. I, I have an older brother, Big Nick. He's three years older than me. He used to kick the shit out of me all the time if I got caught cutting out of school or anything like that. So all of these different influences, my cousin Joe and my cousin Peter from the junkyard, they kept me on the straight and narrow. And that's how I wound up getting into the police force. Nice. And Phil, you know what? I mean, you know, Phil's Italian, you're Irish. So when I see an Irishman, I say, you know what? Okay, he's a cop. So, <laughs> I mean, so right away, how about you? Did you have any family members that were cops? Yeah, my, my father was a cop, and actually my younger brother was a cop. And I sort of um, resisted the temptation to become a cop. I didn't come on the job till I was 28, which was pretty late. Because you used to be able to go, come on the job when you were 20. And I tried some other things. I had a degree in broadcast journalism, and that didn't work out. And I was tending bar, and when I took the test, and it was time I got called. And to tell you the truth, I so when I came in the police department, I loved the job right away. It was like that was what I was meant to do. And I wound up in plain clothes in, in a year and a half. I was still on probation. I, they put me into anti-crime, and I never looked back. And then I made boss with less than five years on the job, and I was a boss for – uh, 22 of my 27 years on the NYPD. I worked my way into uh, the robber unit and then detective bureau. And then my five, my last 10 years, I was in uh, Manhattan North Homicide Squad, which was probably the best job on the police department. I was offered, well, I was there for three months and I got a call from the chief that said, I see you put an application in for Joint Terrorist Task Force. He goes, if you want to come in, he goes, this is the interview, you're in. He goes, I'm telling you, you're in. And I said, chief. I just get into homicide. If I leave, my name will be mud. And I go, I can't do it. I go, thank you. But so I turned down JTTF, which is like a huge, huge career move on the police department. Because when you, you work with the feds and when you leave, you can get a job like anywhere, you know. So I, I turned down JTTF too, but it was offered to me by, you'll know him, Jimmy won't know him, by Crazy Al King. He offered it to me. I was already second grade. And he says, come on, come to JTTF and, and, and you'll, you'll get first grade. I'll give you a car. You could go to Guantanamo Bay and break balls with the Yeah, you got a car. You got a credit card. You work yeah, you got the phone. phone. Now, this was like, two, it was after 9-11. It was 2001. Yeah. And I said, listen, the, the, I left Coney Island. I was in the Coney Island squad for a lot of years. I left, of course, of this guy. And he had like an enlightening. And he was like, he wanted to make up for, you know, some bad blood that we had in the past. I was like, listen, boss, I don't know how long I'm going to stay. I got over 20 years. I'm in Intel. At the time, I was running around in Intel. I was doing great. And I had a great The sauce is overheating on the pot at my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't. I got to keep an eye on the sun. So. But I didn't trust the guy. I would have went to JTTF, but I didn't trust him. So, so I let it go. Crazy out king. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 Phil. I mean, do you make sauce every Sunday? No, my wife does. My, my wife, believe it or not, my wife is Spanish, but she grew up in in uh, Bensonhurst. Uh, her mother is a tremendous cook. My mother-in-law could cook anything. And over the years, uh, she loaned my wife uh, a lot of the recipes. My mother-in-law lived with us for a lot of years. So she picked up a lot from her mother. And then, you know, my family's little influences, I guess, too. But uh, she's a wicked cook, my wife. And I got to watch the waistline or else, you know, I'll blow up. You know, Jimmy, I love going out to dinner with Italian guys. Like, they're always like, they take control of the table. They're like this with the waiter. Like, hey, hey, come over here. Oh, oh, we you know, ordering hey, the appetizers. Oh, it's like a traffic before. cop at the table, you know. Like, I love just sitting back and watching it, you know. I, I tell you what, that's what my girl says. You know, we go out to dinner, we go to certain restaurants, and as soon as they go in, I mean, right away they know me because I like to go to restaurants where they know me. Yeah, me and they, too. And, they, and hey, Jimmy, you know how you doing? I say, hey, you know, how's everything? And they just put us to the table, and they know, you know, what? I go to restaurants. I like to eat a steak with like a broccoli rabe. That's like my favorite dish, you know. 
my girl, she's like a, a salmon. You know, she likes salmon. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, so you know what? You were the boss of the North Homicide Division. Now, what is, you know, the boss, what is the boss doing? And, you know, what, what are you well, doing? Well, you know, Jimmy, what, actually, there was a commanding officer who was a lieutenant, and there was three sergeants with, that each had six detectives under them. And there was an A team, B team, and a D team. And we would work four on and two off. We'd work two four to ones and two day tours. And so it went around the whole clock. Whenever there was a shooting or a murder or a major case, we would respond. And that was in the entire Manhattan North. So there were 13 precincts. But really, like four or five precincts were, was where we got all our work. That's where, you know, the three two, uh, the three four, the two five, the two three, two eight. That's where all the murders were, you know. Every once, if you got a murder like in the nineteenth, it was a rarity, but it was a big news thing, you know. Anywhere from 59th Street to 96th on the East Side, you know, that's the most expensive real estate on this earth. So if someone gets killed there, all of a sudden everyone gives a shit, you know. Where if someone gets shot on 135th Street and uh, and Broadway, no one cares, you know. Yeah, of course. And uh, so. You guys, uh, the question I had next was, uh, you guys ever run into any mobsters? Oh, yeah. I See, I, that, that's the funny thing about my career. We didn't run into mobsters in Manhattan North. There was organized crime, but it was black organized crime or Hispanic organized crime. There were home invasion teams, things like that. There was really no Italian organized crime in Manhattan North. Maybe wise guys lived in Manhattan, some of them, but... They didn't. They didn't play their trade that we could see anyway. They weren't doing murders in Manhattan, you know. How about you, Phil? Well, uh, I was in a six-zero squad in Coney Island during the Colombo Mob War. So, uh, you know, when all of that craziness was going on, the guy that I brought up earlier, Nicky Black, Nicky Granasio, he gets whacked on Avenue U. He gets shot and killed by uh, Larry Mazur and uh, yeah. Greg Scarpa during a. Uh, you know, they pulled up on him and they blasted him. So I responded over there. Uh, I saw Nicky Black. I knew him from growing up. It was a, a really gory homicide. He had been hitting like the back of the head with a shotgun blast. And it really uh, did some major damage. And, and he was a big guy. He was a big fuck. He was like a bear, you know. So anyways, uh, during that time, I mean, there was a lot of shit going on. Um, there was another shooting, uh, probably very close to that shooting, where a guy shows, a kid shows up in in, uh, in Coney Island Hospital. He's shot like in the hip or something. Uh, where did it happen? He's not being cooperative. He's a wise guy's son. Um, the guy's name was Bobo Malpizo. He had a sports club uh, uh, on McDonald Avenue up near Kings Highway. And immediately after word got out about that, when we had just gotten to the hospital, the whole homicide squad came. We were all there trying to interview the kid. The father saying, listen, you know, he was a gentleman about it. He's, listen, guys, you know I can't talk to you, bop, bop, bop. All of a sudden, word comes over the radio that uh, a bagel store on 3rd Avenue in Bay Ridge, somebody walked in and blasted an 18-year-old kid and killed him. Uh, that was all part of the Colombo mob war. So things were spinning out of control. Now, like I said, I grew up on Avenue U. I knew a lot of the guys growing up. I knew the Frankie Lino, Eddie Lino, Bobby Lino, uh, Nikki Black. I knew a lot of them. And, uh, you know, so now I come in one day and they're like, all right, the, the bosses came together with an idea. Uh, they're sending the district attorney's office is sending out grand jury subpoenas to every gangster in Brooklyn and it's all working out of, out of the six O squad, you know? So every detective is going to take four subpoenas and it was like for the next day or the day after that, these guys had to show up in court. So I run over to the stack and, you know, they're having like this big meeting and I'm looking through, I got to grab four names of people. I don't know. Cause I don't want to knock on somebody's <laughs> door that I know. And they're going to be like, Hey Phil, come on in, have a cup of black coffee, you know? So I grabbed four names from guys like downtown Brooklyn, uh, down on president street. They assigned me with a guy from the DA's office. I says, listen, I got the guys we're going to hit already. He's like, can I take a look at the names? <laughs> Maybe he knew somebody. We both looked at it. We went out, you know, knocked on the door. One was the guy. Guy wasn't home, gave it to the wife. The other two guys, they, everybody was fairly respectful. For the most part, when I ran into gangsters, uh, once or twice I had guys that were disrespectful and I had to go right back at them. But for the most part, they knew we were doing a job. Uh, the old school guys. They were all right. You know, listen, all right, fellas, how are you? What's going on? They always try to offer you something to eat or, 
something to drink. Would you like a cup of coffee? Listen, we're not here for that. We, you know, I actually had to lock up one of the workers in Gargiulio's restaurant in, uh, in Coney Island one time. And that's a big, they're not mob, uh, mob related, but, uh, you know, different people hang out in there and stuff. So that was a little touchy, but it was like a crazy story. It was a, a young girl had gotten sexually abused by one of the workers. And uh, when I went in there, they were like almost trying to cover for the guy. And I, I looked the owner in the eye and said, listen, I don't come in here. I'm not a customer. I'm not trying to break your balls. But if this was your daughter, what would you want? Well, if it was my daughter, I says, listen, the people who this happened to, they're not going to break the guy's legs. They want him arrested. Don't break my balls. I won't break yours. Produce the guy. Sure enough, they produced the guy. We locked the guy up. It went to court, and that was it. But they they had a lot of respect. And most of the gangsters that I ran into over the years, they were always respectful to me. I got nothing bad to say about any of them. You know, uh, Jimmy, one, one of the things you learn about being a cop, like when you're on the street, it's different than being a detective or a sergeant in the squad. When I was an anti-crime, both at, which is plain clothes, both as a cop and as a boss, I, I hated the criminals. You know what I mean? I had this thing where I just wanted to fuck, you know, because they were victimizing old ladies, knocking people, robbing, sticking guns at people. And I really had that us versus them thing. But then once I got into the squad, it was a little different because it was more of like, like an intelligent type of police work where you, you could take your time and you could do an investigation, identify someone that's doing a robbery or whatever and go and pick them up. Whereas the street, there was much more tension to be out there for eight hours cruising around in an unmarked car looking, we used to call it going hunting, you know, going hunting for a collar. And it, it, it makes you a little, it's a little, it's a lot different actually, you know. Well, you know, you guys are old school guys. As you know, the world has changed. I mean, to be a cop today, I mean, I think it's a lot harder compared to how it was back then. Back then you had a lot of leeway, uh, Back then, I think uh, if you had someone in the squad car, if they made it to the precinct, they were lucky. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, today, you know what? You, you know, you got to be so, uh, you know, careful and you, you know, you have to do things a certain way. Right away, they got to put their camera on. Body you, camera, on yeah. Everything's so different. I mean, so, you know, what do you guys, you know, I know how you guys feel about that, but, you know, how times changed, uh, you know, Jimmy, I just got to make a comment before you go further into about you. It sounds like you're going into talking about how things are today, but just real quick. Um, and you might relate to this too, because you had interactions with the cops as a kid growing up. Now for me, when I was in uniform, I got met with a different, you know, uh, people, people were, uh, you know, if, if the victim was reaching out to you, they were always very respond responding to you. But a lot of times you wouldn't get the respect. As I went into plain clothes, I was in anti-crime. The respect got a little bit more. And then when I was a detective, I always prided myself on looking good. You know, I would put on a suit. I would always try to dress nice. And it seemed like they would, you know, you go to the scene of something, let's say a homicide, a shooting, whatever. They would push the uniform cop out of the way. They push the anti-crime cop out of the way to come and talk to you to give you the information a lot of times. And I think that, uh, listen, I worked in Coney Island in the projects. For the most part, I didn't deal with a lot of gangsters and stuff like that. It was a lot of, uh, you know, drug dealers and different people and, and you know, people that are uh, on the lower end of the uh, of the totem pole, so to speak. You know, people that are poor. And, you know, I went into them projects and. I wasn't afraid of nothing. I mean, I felt like when I was working that nothing could stop me. And, you know, uh, when I knocked on the door, uh, the minute I got respect, I gave it right back. I was very nice to people. I treated everybody the same. But the minute that somebody tried to disrespect me, that's when, you know, it, it just became a whole different uh, atmosphere, you know? How about you, Bill? Yeah, I mean, it's the truth that, you know, you treat people with respect and you don't... Uh... You know, for the most part, you treat someone with respect, you get respect. And, you know, usually you get more respect when you're eight, you're in plain clothes or if you're wearing a suit, you're a detective. They look at you, you know, they look at you as an old dog and they know, hey, this guy didn't get to where he's at because he's an idiot. You know what I mean? He got to be an old dog because he passed all of those new dog tests, you know? I'll tell you, you know what? You know, I got a couple of tickets for speeding. As soon as I get pulled over, what I do is I shut the car off. I put my hands on the steering wheel. You know what I mean? I roll down the windows and I say, yeah. The lights on, the interior lights. Yeah, you know, and uh, like, you know, I cooperate with the uh, officer. You know what I mean? You know, what did I do? Of course, I know what I did. And I try to talk my way out of getting a ticket. You know, so obviously some people are ignorant and they want to, uh, 
you know, uh, try to, uh, you know, go at the cop and uh, argue become, with the cop. Be combative like, with the cop. Yeah. yeah, be combative, exactly, you know. But, uh, you know, look, the world is changing and things are changing. And, uh, you know, it's rough out there to be a cop today, I tell you. You know, I'm sure. No, somebody- Jimmy, what changed everything really is video and uh, phone cameras. Every time you take any action, people are videotaping you, you know. So you have to do everything correctly. And using force, you know, back in the day, if someone disrespected you, you smacked him across his face. And he understood That's- that he deserved it because he wised off. You do that now, they're going to put cuffs on you, you know? That, yep, that's what changed. And uh, Graffiti Mouth X, did you guys know Frank Serpico? That's, that's before, before our time. That's yeah, way before, before our, our time. time. He's still Would alive, you- that guy. Yeah, he's, he's still uh, – he uh, he was seen in Greenwich in, in um, Little Italy not long ago by a friend of mine. I don't know. My friend was – He's still uh, stirring uh, up shit. Yeah, you know James. James, the guy that we went to the uh, we went to the funeral with, uh, Big James, and uh, he was saying that he met him. He knows him, but uh, you, you know, uh, going back to to the to the respect and all of that, I think that um, yeah, you know, there was a time when people got smacked in the mouth if they wised off, but I don't think that. Uh, not many people wised off back in them days. You know what I mean? I, I listen, when we walked into the room and, and, and or we walked into a situation, most of the time people, you know, they go back on their heels a little bit and they kind of, you know, you got, you got a drunk or you got a wise guy that you had to do what you had to do. But today, like you said, Jimmy, people are getting pulled over for, uh, you know, running a red light or, or a stop sign or talking on a cell phone and they're ready to start fighting with the cop and rolling. And, and I just, I've seen a lot of these incidents go bad. And I always tell people, you know, if you comply, you don't die. And and the, the Black Lives Matter people, they should really be sending that message out that, listen, if a cop pulls you over for a ticket or whatever, you know, if you don't resist and you and you comply with his orders, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get handcuffed. You're going to be sent to a precinct or a jail and you're going to be out and you'll be able to fight it. But if you start to fight with the guy and things go bad and the guy could be a new Jack or he's nervous or he accidentally shoots you and killed you, you know, wh- wh- who's going to suffer then? Your family's going to suffer, you know? So uh, that's the message I try to send out to the young people. Don't fight with the cops. It's not worth it. You're not going to win. You're going to lose. And God forbid some tragedy could happen. And nobody wants that, you know. Listen, the baddest guy in the world doesn't belo- uh, doesn't deserve to get shot unwarrantedly. You know what I mean? It, it, by accident, some cop's gun goes off or something like that. So if you comply, you don't die. Just try and remember that. <laughs> yes. And uh, on your podcast, what was the highest number you got so far, like in the chat? We had 6,000 once. Are you serious? Yeah. It was it we, When we hit that, those stories of um, – uh, uh, Wells, the summer Tom Wells, Wells and Gabby 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 in Tennessee, we hit 6,000. But I mean, we've never even get anywhere near that anymore. You know, we if we get three, four hundred, we're happy now. But that was like, uh, we, you know, the, the show we did with Sammy, we have 63,000 views now. But you know, it keeps growing, people, people keep watching it. You know, right now, right now we got 305 in the chat. That's, That's good. That's a good number. But, but I'll tell you, you guys. You know, you guys have a great podcast. You uh, have all kinds of guests on there. And uh, you guys are doing a great job. You know, Thank Jimmy, you, one of the things we try to do is to have, like, eclectic type of guests. You know, because if you just have one type of guest or if you have just one type of formula, people get bored, you know. Like tonight we're having a district, a, a retired Manhattan district attorney, Dan Bibb, who got a murder conviction uh, without a body. And the case was a as Dr. Bierenbaum killed his wife in 1985. He got away with it for 15 years. In, two, in 2000, they d- decided to prosecute him. And they found out that he had strangled her, threw her in the trunk of his car, drove to the airport where he, he was a pilot, threw her in a plane, flew the plane over the Atlantic between Montauk and Cape May or whatever it was, and threw her out of the, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean. They never found her body. But wow. this district attorney got a conviction on all how, how Billy, how long? It was a long time. It was like 10 years before there was a conviction. Before you, was know, but, you know, it was 15 years before he was charged. He killed yeah. her in 1985. Yeah. So this guy thought that he was going to get away with it. 
Yeah, he moved was, to uh, North Dakota or he moved to another state. He, had he was on with his life. Yeah, he moved yeah. on. He's a plastic uh, surgeon. And actually last year, he's up for parole. And he admitted he did it exactly the way the district attorney said he did. That's crazy. Yeah. That was some case. Imagine putting together a case like that, though. I mean, think about it. Nobody. And they found all these other different things. Uh, witnesses at the airport with his private plane. People saw him going out with the uh, with, with what turned out to be the body, you know, hidden in. What was it hidden in? A, in a it was in like bag? a duffel bag he threw yeah, into the back yeah. of his trunk. It, it's really an amazing story. And it's very difficult to charge somebody without no body. You know, that's one of the things that that that's one of the humps you have to get over when you're doing an investigation on a murder. But, you know, now you don't even have a body. But our good friend Tommy Dades, he's tried and convicted some people uh, in the past that where bodies were never recovered. So it's not easy, but it's possible. Well, yeah. then, Jimmy, the reason we're having them on is because we were covering this case of these two kids from Bakersfield, California. And 16 months ago, they were, were reported missing by their parents. And they were four years old and three years old. And the story sucked that their parents told. The district attorney just gave a um, press conference last week. And she said, we have evidence that the kids were dead three months before their parents reported them missing. So both parents were locked up for murder. So again, it's going to be a case they're going to try without the bodies. Bodies still haven't been recovered. Yeah. And it's just such a horrific story because the kids are three and four years old. And then there's other kids in the house, two of their own, and then two other adopted kids. And th the information we're getting is that the parents enlisted the younger kids to beat the hell out of the uh, the, the two kids that are now dead. So uh, it's really a horrible, it's a horrible, horrible story. story. Yeah. It's like a... Uh, it's like the, the, the system, you know, uh, something slipped through the system, you know, slipped through the uh, cracks of the system because these kids were forced to care and then adopted by the parents. And then uh, it just, it turned bad. So uh, yeah, that's, that, that's the story that we did a couple of days ago. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to have Dan Bibb on tonight at nine on our show to talk about the uh, no body homicides. I got to watch that. I'll tell you, you guys have a lot of interesting cases on your uh, channel. You guys are doing really good. Thank yeah, you, you know, you got to just keep uh, your sort of your ear to the ground and to come up with some of these cases or to, um, you know, cover when you cover a case, as you know, or a story that you don't know a lot about, you got to do a lot of research or you sound like a boob, you know? So you got to find out because if you say something wrong, people in the chat go, that's wrong. You didn't get it. And oh, you're like, yeah. oh, take it easy. Take it easy. Yeah. But you guys, like you guys growing up, did you guys ever like commit a crime? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I can tell I could tell you a quick story. I, I was with my friends. I was probably about maybe 15, 16 years old. And I hung out with guys that were two or three years older than me. And uh we were by PS95 schoolyard. You know where that is, Jimmy, right? Over, over uh, off Avenue. So we're yes. on the neck roadside. We're walking by and we walk by a car that's running. Somebody jumped out of this car and it's running and uh I was like, come on, guys, let's go for a ride. And I went, go to get in the car. And one of my friends grabs me by the collar, my friend Joey Skull, uh, and he pulls me away. He's like, what are you, crazy now? I have to stay away from the car. A second later, here comes anti-crime pulls up. They must have saw that the, the, the car was stolen and whoever jumped out of it. They were waiting to see who was going to get into it. I was a step away from getting in the car. Uh, they jump out. What are you guys doing? Where are you from? All right, get the fuck out of here. They chased us, you know. But had I gotten in that car and maybe went for a ride, I might not have had the career that I had, you know. <laughs> How about, like, years ago, the crimes are so different than today, you know. The same thing with a drug of choice with people in the street. I mean, back then, there was a, a lot of cocaine, a lot of drug deals going down. Today, like you said, there's a lot of cameras. You know what I mean? How does a police officer do his job today? Wow, you got you got to just uh, you got almost have to observe the crime because uh, you know taking action if you don't have probable cause, boom, like that. You know, there's so many people watching you and cameras watching you, and not just people with cameras, stationary cameras. That's why it's even tough for people to get away with crime. Look at all these recent homicides. The one uh, that that poor girl that was killed in that East Harlem um, Burger King by that. that savage, that was all put together by cameras. They tracked him 
going down into the subway and they used the subway cameras. They saw he got out of location in Brooklyn. That's how that guy was caught. So every, you know, detective work is so much different too. I mean, if the, everything is trackable. Cell phones are trackable, right? You, everyone has easy pass. You're a fool if you don't have easy pass because you'd be waiting at a toll booth for a day to, for, for, right? People used to say, I don't want, I don't want easy pass. I don't want anyone knowing where I am. They changed that, they changed that up when they sit at a toll booth, right? Waiting to go through it, but and, everything trackable. And you see, and you see all these devices on these poles now. They're cameras, and yeah. if someone shoots a gun, you know what where, where the shot was fired from. They have something called shot yeah. tracker. Yeah, yeah, they have those yeah. up uh, on. They have those in locations where the most shootings happen, and they can pinpoint where the gun was fired from. It's amazing, you know. Wow, I'll tell you, technology. Yep. It, it, listen, it made it a lot easier today for the detectives. Certain things got easier and other things got harder. Like, uh, it, you know, we would have had to be doing knocking on doors, canvases, trying to find witnesses in that Burger King murder had there not been all that video camera. Maybe person would have got caught, maybe not. But I think it makes it a lot easier now. And like Bill said, with the traffic cameras, there, there's a thing called plate readers. You know, uh, you go through tolls now. There's certain areas where either you have easy pass or you don't. And it takes a picture. And if you don't, they mail you the bill. So you could pull that information. Like if you think somebody went over to Verrazano Bridge at a certain time, you could pull that information off the cameras and you'll catch the car. You'll catch a picture of the car. You might see who's in the car. So there's a lot of different things technology-wise that helps law enforcement. The things that got um, a little bit more uh, difficult are like when we used to do interviews, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I violated anybody's civil rights, but, you know, they want you reading the guy to rights from the minute you put handcuffs on him. And, you know, there, there's been times when uh, if a guy doesn't cooperate, he, he could really be hurting himself, you know, and I, I've been in situations, homicide investigations where, you know, the guy was maybe an accomplice or he was with somebody, didn't know what was going to happen. They don't want to talk. And then, you know, uh, it makes it more difficult for them down the line. And then there's cases where people cooperate and they actually take themselves out of the criminal uh, liability end of it. So, you know, listen, everybody's got their constitutional rights. Everybody knows about that. So, you know, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk. But uh, sometimes it's in your best interest. I know people might not agree with this, but sometimes it, depending on the situation, you know, it might be in your best interest to tell the story and maybe you could get out from under. But that's something maybe you got to think about and maybe discuss with your attorney. too. I'll tell you, you know, you talk about that case with the, with the young girl that got killed in Burger King. You know, that's such a sad story. You know what I mean? Because that's on camera. And uh, like that Terrible. girl who was 19 years old. Yeah, yeah, 19. 19 years old, a beautiful girl. I mean, yeah. I got two, I got two daughters, and I think about my kids. I worry about them. You know, today you leave the you leave the house, you don't know what to expect out there. I mean, the world is going crazy. The, the worst part about that case is that she gave the money, and he just shot at a shooter. He was a he was a friggin' savage. I didn't want to use the language, but a real savage. I, I, that's disgusting. It's terrible. And you know what's going on with gun crime in the city today? Uh, all of these politicians, you know, they they talk to talk. Uh, but they don't walk the walk, you know? I mean, you got to get out there. They took away, we had a thing that was very widely used to take guns off the street called stop, question, and frisk. Now, you, you weren't just stopping people arbitrarily. You had to have levels of suspicion and then, you know, you would talk to them. And then if you felt that it was the next level, you could uh, frisk them. And, you know, uh, they took that away. They took away the plain clothes anti-crime. Those were the guys that secrete themselves into the neighborhood you know, you're going into areas where there's high crime. You know that there's guys, gangs, whatever, carrying guns. And you watch it for different things. Either, you know, if there's robbery patterns, maybe you catch a guy when he's about to do a robbery and you stop it. All of those things were taken away. And then the other thing in New York and across the country, they have this bail reform where, uh, you know, you, you you get arrested and they're letting a the guy out before the cop finishes the paperwork. A lot of that is what's causing this uptick in crime. And, and then, again, you know, just looking the other way on jumping the turnstile in New York or drinking beer in public or smoking a joint in public. Those are the things that led to, you know, uh, keeping crime down. Believe it or not, people don't realize that those were the quality of life crimes that caused the big crime drops in the, uh, in the nineties. I'm going to tell you guys, you know what? I work in Manhattan every so often, Manhattan, Jersey city. I'm a teamster. 
And uh, sometimes I got to take the train to Manhattan. And you know what? I hate to take the train. I mean, there's only trouble in the train. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have standing contests with these people. And you have a lot of mental patients roaming the subways. Oh you know, and a lot of homelessness going on. You know, what do you guys think about that? You know, I, I think that they should empty all the trains and the streets of all the homeless people. No one belongs living in the trains. No one belongs riding the trains to the exclusion of a paying customer. And it's ridiculous. You know, these people are, are walking time bombs. And same thing on the streets. Someone uh, last year tried to pitch a tent on the mall of 86th Street and Broadway on the Upper West Side. To the credit of the police... And uh, the neighborhood, they, they were like, no, we're not putting up with this shit. Get that tent. You know, next thing you know, it'll be San Francisco, you know. And they can't allow that to happen in this city. But I'll tell you something. That's why a lot of people leave in New York. Because the electorate is out of their mind. And that's the people that elect these, these politicians. And the politicians are nuts, too. There was just an article today in the New York Times. They're opening all these marijuana dispensaries. And they're going to give a bunch of them to people and families of people who have been previously arrested for marijuana crimes. And I'm just like, what is that about? You know, they say, oh, these people were victimized by being arrested for marijuana. No, it was against the law at the time they were arrested. So now they're going to give them first dibs on getting some of these marijuana dispensary locations. i tell you, it's something victimized because today everyone cries victim. Yeah. And, uh, I tell you, I was watching a video on YouTube about in Manhattan at the Supreme Court building, all over the Supreme Court building, it said, no pigs allowed. I mean, I don't get it, you know? I mean, I mean, it, there's no respect for NYPD no more, you know? I mean, the world is going crazy. I think a lot of that also comes from the politicians allowing taking the tools away from the police to do their job so that the public feels that they can disrespect the police. Because now, you know, perfect example. Someone told me there was this nutcase in Penn Station and he's going off and there's like 10 cops around him just doing a dance. No one's doing anything because they're afraid to put their hands on the guy because the cameras come out and all of a sudden people are like, oh, you didn't need to use that much force, you know? So instead, they're still watching the guy. They're not doing anything. And what happens? It shuts down everything. I, I just mope one day on the train, is going crazy on the train, and the, it's rush hour, and the whole train's not going any, anywhere. Two guys from EMS come on a train, same thing. They don't want to put their hands on a guy. All of a sudden, a big six foot five, six foot six inch Rasta goes on the train, grabs a guy, and just tosses him right off the train. And the problem. He probably wanted to get home, the guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, he he just tosses him. I go, that's what the police and the EMS yeah. should have done. They're afraid to put their hands on people because of the cell phone cameras, because of the body cameras. And, you know, if you put your hands on somebody, and I, I tell people this all the time, there is no force that looks good on camera. So no. when I go to arrest somebody, when I was on the job, and I'd say, put your hands behind your back, and it could be a 120-pound lady or, you know, a 275-pound football player when they said no you had to use force if somebody's videotaping it it just doesn't look good no matter what so and that's the thing that people understand so now cops because they're getting indicted at the drop of a hat you know you go to work as a plumber if you make a little mistake you know maybe there's a flood or something you know no big deal you make a mistake as a cop you're going to lose your livelihood and you could wind up in jail so these cops are being extra careful and i think society changed a lot too now i'm going to give you a quick story from the early 80s i was in uniform and i was working in the 70 and you'll know edward r morrow high school jimmy uh we happen to drive back there and i see these young young white jewish kids and they're spray painting uh with the spray paint on the school so I jump out of the car, I grab the spray paint from the kid, and the, and the kid, you could see a clean-cut kid that came from a good family and looked like they had money. So I says, wow, it's a nice jacket you got on. He goes, oh, yeah, you know, my mother just bought it for me. I says, turn around. What do you mean? I says, turn around. I took the spray paint and I put an X on the back of his. It was like a suede leather jacket. I put the X on. I says, now go home and tell your mother and father that that's what you get for spray paint on the school. I took the can, I threw it into the dumpster, and we let the kids go. So now I forget about it. A couple hours later, I go into the precinct for meal and I see 
I see the ex. The kid is sta standing at the desk officer, uh, the, in front of the desk, talking to the desk officer. His mother's got his arm around him, and I hear her saying, I want to talk to the cop. I want to talk to the cop. So now I slip in to try and go upstairs, <laughs> and the desk officer says, Grimaldi, uh, come here a second. I walk over. He says, this lady wants to talk to you. She goes, are, are you the officer that did this to my son's jacket? Now I'm thinking, if I say yes, you know, I'm in trouble. I says, why? She goes, well, I just want to thank you because I, he told me he was spray painting on the school and you did. I'm going to make him wear that jacket every day. The lady was on board. I bet the kid never picked up a can of spray paint again. And listen, that, that was like stupid to me. Spray painting on a building, a beautiful school. It was so ridiculous. It was the first thing I thought of. Listen, I could have brought the kid in and gave him a record and something. I didn't see it that way. I seen it as, let me, let me make the kid understand what he did was wrong. And the mother was right along with it. Now today, I could be charged with a crime if you do that, if you're a uniform cop today. It's a different world. So, you know, that that's what I'm saying. You know, say uh, a guy's a cop, he has a family. You know what? He's basically just going to work, put your hours in and come home. You know what? You see something, don't do anything. I mean, because you know what? Like you said, right away he's being criticized, I mean, for doing his job. Yeah, that's, the, you know, they call that the Ferguson effect. And that was from that case in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Remember the hands up, don't shoot. That turned yes. out to be all bullshit. The cop, the, the guy tried to grab the cop's gun. He uh, punched the cop when the cop he was inside the car. Yeah. And the cop shot and killed him. And the riot, Missouri rioted for weeks after that. And the whole rallying cry, and it was done by the NFL, the NBA, was hands up, don't shoot. And that turned out to be a lie. That never happened. The guy that was with his co-conspirator is, is guy that did the robbery of the little bodega stealing cigarettes or cigars or whatever. He's the one that said that. And everyone took that as the truth. And that's what inflamed the riots. Hands up, don't shoot. That never, ever happened, you know. The politicians also helped inflame that situation because the minute that the guy said, hands up, don't shoot, instead of the politicians calling for comments saying, listen, let the investigation work itself out. Let's find out the facts. They just, oh my God, hands up, don't shoot. And, and things just went spiraled out of control. And then the federal government, Eric Holder's FBI, investigated that case and they found that that cop did absolutely nothing wrong that the guy uh i think his name was michael brown i, I was it michael brown, brown was the guy he shot i forget to kill yeah, the yeah that, that's what i'm talking about michael brown he punched yeah. the cop in the face broke his cheekbone they found michael brown's dna on the cop's gun he was grabbing for the cop's gun so in a fight for his life he shot the guy unfortunately the guy was killed but the guy's actions are what caused it. It got completely blown out of proportion. The cop that it happened to had to leave the state. He had to move. He had to resign from the police force. Now, his life is never going to be the same. And, and listen, it's a tragedy that that guy was killed, but it was his own actions that caused it. It wasn't the cop. You know, cops don't wake up in the morning and put their gun belt on and their, and their badge and their vest and say, I'm going to go out and kill somebody, an innocent person. Don't work that way, you know? You know, and then you had the case here, uh, Eric Garner. Uh, with the cop Pantaleo. That yes. was with the untaxed cigarettes. That was uh, uh, Staten, Island. It, Staten Island. Yeah, and they called it the chokehold case, and he died. And that, I mean, that cop was put through through hell for like two and a half, three years, and then he was fired. And uh, you know what the funny thing about that case, Billy, is, is that guy was arrested 32 times for minor infractions. He never was charged with resisting arrest that day. And it's on video. It's on the, it's on the video. He said, I'm not going today. That's it. I'm not going. He just says, I'm not going to jail today. And he decided to fight with the cops. Now, right. again, it goes back to what I said in the beginning. If he would have complied, he wouldn't have died. He wouldn't have died that day. That's for sure. And you know, it just turned out to be a horrible tragedy. He died. The cop's life was ruined. The city had to deal with all the uh, the protests and stuff, and uh, it's really unnecessary. But let me ask you a question. Now, this guy, Eric Gardner, he was selling cigarettes, right, with the tax uh, things on it. He was selling Lucy's, Jim. He was selling Lucy's. He was selling Lucy's. Now, in all honesty, like, I look at that not even as a crime. You know? Yeah, it, it's bullshit, but you know something they were told by someone actually the at community a very high level from the mayor's office. Yeah, true. They were getting community. complaints about it. So they were sent out by the Staten Island Borough Commander, I want you to enforce this. We're getting a lot of complaints. Yeah. And that's because why I, it was enforced. 
Yeah, you know what it is? Because I look at that compared to what's going on today. I mean, that was that that was nothing compared to what's going on today. I mean, seriously, I mean, the cops today, if my children said they want to be a cop, I'm going to be honest. I said, you know what? Don't be a cop because I'd be scared of death for them. Yeah. You no, know? I mean, I would tell them, you know what? Choose something else to become. Well, because you know, in eight years of the Blasio, he destroyed the city in eight years of him being the mayor. Just destroyed the city. Absolutely. You, you know, one last thing about Ghana. Uh, the, the business owners, the store owners over there were co complaining to the community board. It went through to the mayor's office and then it went to the borough command and they said, go over there. Now, normally, if, if somebody called the cops, a uniform patrol, like if it was me or if it was Bill, we'd go over and say, buddy, get the hell out of here. Just chase the guy. He would, you know, nothing would ever happen, you know. But because it went through those channels, they said, go there and, and do some enforcement, make an arrest. And things just went bad real quick, you know. I tell you, it's very uh, hard to do their job today, uh, NYPD. Yeah, Absolutely, but you know who, you, who pays the price for it is uh, the regular citizens who have a much less safe city because police are afraid to uh, to do their job. You know. So, if you guys go out, right? You go out to dinner. What do you guys order to drink? <laughs> I know what Billy orders. He's a he's a Cabernet guy. I like Cabernet. How about you? I'll, I'll do either. Uh, I really like a good scotch, but if it's just like a casual, you know, I don't drink a lot. I'm gonna have some. I'll have like a a, a vodka and cranberry or something like that, I don't, or maybe a martini, something like that. Those either a vodka or a scotch. Those are my two go-to drinks, or a beer. But if yeah. they don't, Jimmy, if they don't have good wine, I'll I drink Corona. <laughs> if the yeah. wine sucks, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a martini guy. Yeah. You drink Cosmos, Jim, or anything like that? You ever have that? A Cosmopolitan? Yeah, every so often. You know, yeah. uh, back in the day when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, I go to dinner now, and, you know, my wife likes to try all these fancy drinks and stuff. And they, they got some really good mixologists in some restaurants. And, uh, like, something with blood orange and vodka or something like that, I'll go for that. But, uh, you know, I, I was out this past weekend for my mother laws birthday. I had a couple of uh, McCallum's, McCallum scotch, which is nice. Gives you... It gets rid of all the pain in your body. <laughs> nice. I thought he was going to say he wants a Sambuca Romano with three beans. <laughs> Got to have the three beans. I tell you, you know what? You guys, it's like, look, back in the day, if you look at the old TV shows, like, uh, you know, the Dean Martin roast, you guys, like, you guys are good together because you're always making fun of each other. That's how I know you like each other so much, you know? I mean, when you start making fun of each other, then you know, you know what? The relationship is no good no more. That's yeah. true. That's you you true. know what, Jimmy? I had three long-term partners on the job, and two of them were Irish guys. My partner, Artie Williams, who I worked with in 6 squad for a lot of years. But there's two kinds of Irish guys. There's the Irish guys that, like, they'll, they'll like a beer, and they'll eat, like, meat and potatoes. And then there's the other kind of Irish guys, like Bill, that they like Italian food. My other partner from Intelligence Division, Eddie Driscoll, a great guy. I worked with his brother. He liked the Italian food too. So, uh, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with meat and potatoes. I get it. But uh, I just, I gelled with, with Irish guys a lot on the job. But uh, like I said, two of my uh, long-term partners and now my partner in this is, uh, is Billy Cannon. And we both have the same flavor for Italian food. So we get along. <laughs> Bill, what's your favorite Italian dish? I love shrimp parmesan. <laughs> That's my favorite. Okay. Every time I go to an Italian restaurant, I always order that. My wife's like, well, you order something different, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I made him experience L B Spumoni Gardens. That's not right. Ago. We had a, I, I, I had left a, there a like a balloon. I, 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 I couldn't even walk. I ate so much. <laughs> now, do, do they have the same recipe? I think years ago it was better. What, you're talking about the pizza, Jim? Yes. The, the pizza, believe it or not, that the the pizza recipe hasn't changed, but the products sometimes the products change. So maybe they're using a different brand of sauce or something like that. And then you know there was that whole thing with the sauce recipe that was all bullshit. Uh, there was something on on the internet recently. Uh, I think it was on the Vice Channel that had you know they were trying to tie it to organized crime and all of that, but. Just this past Saturday night, I was actually interviewed on a show. It's called New York Homicide. It's on the Oxygen Network. Um, it was season one, episode 10. It's a, a, a show that's done by the former chief of detectives 
when the owner of LMB was killed back in 2016, he's actually a distant relative of mine. Uh, they try to say it was the sauce recipe. It was an argument over the sauce recipe. It turned out not to be true. That was not true. There was, there was allegedly some incident with, uh, some guys out in Staten Island. I don't want to bring up anybody's name, but, uh, that may have happened, but that it did not come as a dis- direct result from the LMB family. Uh, if you watch that episode, you'll see uh, the chief detective says that. He said that we tried every which way to look at it, uh, to, to be linked to organized crime. The FBI was also heavily involved in that case right from the beginning. Uh, the the FBI uh, had to actually give the case back to the state. You know, the, the guy was originally, originally arrested and brought to federal court. He was arrested by the FBI. But because there was no involvement by organized crime or anything like that, the case was then prosecuted by the state. And if you watch that episode, you'll see the uh, the true story. There's a lot, of, a lot of rumor and innuendo going on. There's rumors that they sold the place. I must have heard that a thousand times. It's still the same family for the last 82 or 83 years, so... Just you put know what? that to rest. I, I tell you, you know, that's what I thought. I thought they sold the place because when I order pizza, I see, uh, you know, not Italian faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the night crew in there is is a lot of Egyptian guys. You know, they, they, listen, it's hard to get workers these days. And in the last 15, 20 years, the guys that came to work and showed up and work hard, they happen to be Egyptian guys. And most of them are Coptic uh, Christian guys. Uh, you know, after 9-11, somebody started with a rumor because they were Egyptian that, oh, they sold to Muslims and all of that. It wasn't true. It's still the same family. And listen, when you own a business, whoever comes to work and does the job, that's who you hire. And it is what it is, you know. So when when you joined the NYPD, right, You uh, how do you move up the ranks? There's There's two different ways. One is you can take tests, you know, uh, sergeant, lieutenant, captain. They're all civil service tests or else you can excel on the street and go the route of becoming a detective uh, like Phil did. I, I, I was a really good cop, but I t- took a test. I passed the test and became a sergeant. Then I, w- I was a boss, but I still, because I was a sergeant, I still got to run around on the street. If you make lieutenant for the most part, you're administrative and you don't really get to run around. So I was sort of, I failed the lieutenant's test twice, and I probably was lucky I did because I would have been inside more of an administrative. How does a college professor fail the lieutenant? I don't know, man. I failed it twice, too. (laughs) The last time I failed it by three points, I was like, "Ah, that's it. No more tests. Jimmy, you know, he's not only a retired sergeant from the NYPD. He's a college professor. He taught. uh, He's a comedian. He's an actor. He plays (laughs) instruments. And I was telling him, I said, I'm just – a Guido from Brooklyn that became a detective. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know what? You, you could tell that, uh, you know, he's uh, definitely has some kind of talent, though. You know, I mean, you you too, Phil. I mean, you guys really, uh, you know, you guys are great guys, man. What you do is definitely hard, you know, uh, interviewing these people and talking about all these cases. I mean, I love, I love watching your show. I really do. I'm very interested in this stuff. And tonight I'll definitely be tuning in at nine o'clock for sure. Cool. Jim, you know, I, I got to tell you, it's not easy. Now I know I'm getting a little taste of it. Actually earlier today, Bill and I were on with a, a, one of our uh, people that works for us, that uh, technician. And he was explaining different things about how to load videos and stuff. It's not easy. And I don't know how Bill does it. I don't know how you do it by yourself. It's, it's, very difficult. It's very confusing and it takes time. And then when you're doing live broadcast, that's another thing. This is not easy. When We've had instances where the person was supposed to come on, they came on late or they had a bad connection. And then all of a sudden they dropped out and we had to carry on a show. Well, look, and- we had Chaz Palminteri didn't have his mic on. Yeah, Remember? yeah, yeah. When, when we had Chaz on, uh, we had a little difficulty with him because his mic, his mic was, uh, uh, I guess he was using the mic that was attached to the computer. He didn't have his mic that was in front of him on. And and sometimes these things happen. And uh, when we had Judge Demango on, we had some technical difficulties. She had to switch and we had to, you know, take her out and stuff. So listen, when you do live broadcast, we become veterans at it quick because it's not easy, you know, and uh Sometimes, and we've had people that were very uh, like nasty before we went on the air oh, and yeah. stuff like that. You're right? You, you know. Well, you know, about- I had asked people to come on early so that if they do have a problem with their lighting or their audio, we could fix it. And it's always the people that I'll be on five minutes before, and then of course something goes wrong and you can't fix it the because lighting. you didn't take the time to do it. You know. Yeah. And so you okay. see that arrogant bitch. You know, she wouldn't let us. Right. 
And you know what? Look, I just started getting to learn all this. I mean, I didn't know even how to even put a thumbnail on. And yeah. I just started learning this maybe two weeks ago about the thumbnail. Then I learned about the ticker on the bottom. I, you know, I love I, that. That's great. Wait, yeah. I didn't know how to do. I didn't know how to do the ticker. Seriously, <laughs> I was like, wait. I was doing videos on my phone. Okay, I have Apple phone, Apple laptop. But now I do videos on my laptop. So uh, a couple people walked me through this stuff, and then I started learning. You know, and then I learned on my own. But I tell you, it's, it's complicated, especially when you're you're the quarterback. You're doing everything. You know. Exactly. It took me about nine months to, uh, you know, learn this stuff. Yeah, it's not easy. No, definitely not. not. I see on the uh, on the ticker you're going to have Glaze on. That guy's got some amazing story, Jimmy. That's going to be a great show. I hope your viewers tune in for that one. Thank you for you know what Glaze. I spoke to Glaze one time. I'm going to be talking to him this week. But uh, you know, he was a serious guy. Oh, you know, Wait, is that the pink? Is that the pink houses guy? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And you know that's the thing. You know what? Like, I want to have a conversation with him. You know, the Italians and the blacks. What's the difference as far as you know? What I mean, in the streets. Yeah. You know what? We have organized crime. You know what? They're more uh, with the dope and the gangs and stuff like that. But these, you know, these kids and these guys. Listen, they'll kill you in a minute. You know, what, Jimmy, you're going to have something in common with him, like. Tommy Dades was sort of like a mentor to you, or he helped you. He pulled you out of the, out of the life. Joe Ponzi was the guy from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office that was the one that mentored Glaze and really became the guy that pulled him out and uh, helped him along the way. And and they're still friends till this day, just like your friends with Tommy. You know, so it, it's uh, you, I think you're gonna have a great show with him. I mean, he's got a tremendous uh, tremendous backstory and. I guess you could call it a success story because he came out of it and, you know, he's doing well now. Uh, you know, he was dodging bullets and everything else. So, you know, uh, not easy growing up in them, them areas just to survive through them, you know, without being involved in anything. And then he was involved in a life of crime and he made it through. So that should be a great show. When's he coming? What, what, when is it? Uh, did you have a what, date yet? Not yet. One day this week. And you know okay. what? Growing, growing up like Glaze, I mean, it's either death or prison. That's all. That's where you're going. You, you're getting killed, or you're going to prison. There ain't nowhere else you're going. Right. That's right. But uh, 100%. but yeah, we have uh 319 people in the chat. Listen, I'm not gonna keep you guys too long. But you know what? Did you guys know Anthony Massimillo? I know him. You know I Anthony know Massimillo, six, six seven cop that was uh, shot and killed uh, during. Uh, he was uh, a warrant officer in the precinct. Yes. Tony yeah. Moss, we used to call him. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, I grew up with them. Sally Moss, Anthony Moss. Anthony Moss was uh, you know, one of the better guys in the neighborhood. And uh, you know, he became a cop. He was uh, you know, in the street here and there, but I knew his family, his mother Mary, and stuff like that when I was a kid. But uh, you know, I just wanted to mention his name. Jimmy, since you brought up about Tony Moss, I just want to tell everybody that's listening, uh, you know, when we go through 20 years, 25 years, Billy was 27 years on the job. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of things that affect you. And, you know, I was on the scene. I was involved in two shootouts. I had bullets coming at me and, and I was firing them back two different times, 1982, 1986. And I was on the scene of... Uh, Several cop shootings. I was on the scene of one where a cop was killed and a, another guy that I worked with was shot. And I had to go to the emergency room with the guy that was shot, uh, one of the perpetrators. And I saw the cop who I knew, he was a training officer. I had seen him two hours before he was killed. And I watched as a doctor opened up his chest, stuck his hand into his chest and tried to massage his heart. It's like a last ditch effort to save someone's life. And as that uh, doctor squeezed on his heart. I saw the blood coming out of the bullet holes that he had sustained. And these are the things that, you know, you want to talk about post-traumatic stress. That's the things that cops go through. And, you know, the horrors of the job, like those two cops that were killed recently up in Harlem, the guy that saved the day and, and shot the perpetrator, you know, he's going to carry that for the rest of his life, you know, and anybody else that was there, you know, that, that carried the cop into the emergency room, you know, you see your brother officer, 
bleeding out. Uh, it's something that stays with you. And you know what? I don't have no regrets about it. I love the job. There was times when I first went on the job that if they told me we can't pay you for six months, I probably would have still came to work when I was a new cop. But, uh, you know, there was a handful of bad days. Most of them were good days. I got to say, you know, when you when you solve a murder and you get justice for a family, uh, as a detective, me being, I took the lateral, like Bill was explaining, you know, you could take tests. I took the lateral move. I always wanted to be a detective. Uh, when I'm standing over a dead body with a notebook in my hand and I got no idea who did it. And it's a, you know, whether it's a week later, a month later, or a year later, and I got the guy that did it and he's going to jail for it. Uh, it's pretty euphoric. It's a good feeling. And, you know, when you get to tell that family, you know, we got the guy that did it. Um, it, it, it that also is a reward, I guess you could say. Well, you guys, I really appreciate appreciate you having you know having you on here. Uh, I mean, you did a lot of justice over here, NYPD. Big respect to you guys. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll be watching the show tonight, 9 p.m. Yeah. Police off the cuff. And uh, you know, Jimmy, I just want to thank I want to thank you. Uh, you. You've helped us out a lot uh, since we've been doing this podcast, and we tried to help you too with we call it cross pollination. You taking some of our fans and some of your subscribers come on over to us and we appreciate it. And uh, I had a lot of fun uh, coming on your show tonight. Phil, thank you so much for coming and uh, you too, Phil. Absolutely. Uh, Jimmy, thank you. We got to have you on our show again. And any of our listeners that are watching this, go on Jimmy's uh, YouTube, subscribe, hit the subscribe button. Same thing. If any of your listeners want to come on ours and subscribe, we all work together and uh, just try to put out some good contact. Thank you again, Jimmy. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And respect to NYPD and you guys. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Have a Thanks, good guys. Have a good Bye. night. All Bye. Right. Phil Grimaldi and Bill Cannon. That was very nice of them coming on. I think it was a great show. To all you guys in the chat. Thanks for showing up. We had 333 people in the chat. And uh, tonight you can watch Police Off the Cuff, 9 p.m. They have a great show. Check it out. And uh, you guys, uh, you know, I really appreciate the support you give me. Let's check out this video. The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed. It's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for showing up, and I'll see you in my next video. I love you guys. Thanks for the support. Bye.